Our friends Karen and Harry Clark traveled from uh, Naples, Florida to Houston, and we met up with them at the Houston airport, and we were on the same flight from Houston to uh, Lima. Our flight uh, landed late in, uh, in Lima, and it was like uh, between 1 and 2 a.m. by the time we got to our hotel. Due to the fact that our flights were scheduled to get in so late, uh, the Clarks and Gloria and I had, uh, we had arrived a day early. So we had an extra day in Lima to sort of uh, get our feet on the ground and uh, get caught up a little bit on our sleep and, and just relax a little bit. So that first day, um, we spent that whole afternoon down on the uh, waterfront area of Lima and uh, had lunch down there and just uh, walked around and toured the area, uh, which was quite expansive. And here's some of the pictures we got while we were down there. One of our first uh, experiences with uh, Peruvian cuisine was the drink that Harry is holding in his hand. That drink is a Pisco Sour, and it seems to be the national drink of Peru. Each time we checked into a hotel in Peru, we were given drink coupons for a Pisco Sour. Pisco is uh, made by distilling um, grape juice from the wine regions of Peru, so it's actually a brandy. So the next day, we meet Manuel, our tour leader, and the rest of our group. Manuel goes over uh, expectations and our itinerary, and uh, we get acquainted with the, uh, the other members of our group. Next up is a little walking tour uh, to get to see some more of the sites in this part of the city. Here are some of the uh, images that I captured during that walking tour. The next day, our group is joined by Jose, who will be our uh, local expert guide to show us a few things around Lima. So we all get on board a bus and we head down for the uh, southern end of town for the local fish market. As we approach the fish market, we are introduced to the president of the uh, organization that runs the market here. So with that formality out of the way, we're ready to uh, begin our tour. Kilo flounder, 25. That's $8 for 2.2 pounds. 
Four dollars pound. Four dollars pound. Doesn't matter. Okay, all of this is seafood. And look at those scallops. So big scallops, you know? Octopus, and we have shrimp and mussels and crabs, all of that. Fleas or sand crabs. All right. What is this used for? Bait. This is for bait. Bait. This is for bait, you know. Fisherman snack. Now, I'm not a fisherman. I'm not gonna eat. Right? Fisherman snack. They eat them. They eat them like popcorn. They eat them like popcorn. I'm not kidding about that. I'm not a fisherman. I'm not gonna eat it because they have sand and sea water. Might make me sick. But they do every day. You know? you have any question for you know, it's the rockfish, rockfish, oh, yeah. and that's mallet over there. Okay, take some more pictures and please let's continue this way. And over there on the second floor, that is the, that is the egg. So the fish in the room tastes like fish. <laughs> For our next stop, we visit the Larco Museum. The Larco Museum is a private collection of pre-Columbian art. The grounds of the museum were quite impressive, but there's one more aspect of the museum to be seen. The Larco Museum does have a little bit of a uh, darker side to it. A separate area is the erotica collection. Next up, uh, Jose takes us on a walking tour of the colonial area of Lima. As we are walking through the colonial area, Jose stops and uh, has an interaction with two young men selling pens on the street. Here, right? In this case, he's coming from Venezuela. And he's, uh, you know, selling these pens. And he has this, uh, you know, box, uh, what do you call this? Gloves? Boxing gloves, yeah. Boxing gloves. And that was a bit unusual, so I asked him, why are you carrying this box? And he says that he's fighting for Peru. For Peru. Doesn't In Peru. However, in Venezuela, it's a common sport. Very common, you know. And now, for the last Olympic Games, we normally don't present a baseball team. But we did present this time. Why? That was last year only, yeah? Why? Because of Venezuelan people, that have been nationalized Peruvian. Uh, 
he's going to get nationalized very soon because to, to, to play for Peru, you have to be nationalized. There's no other way, especially if you are in the in the Peru team, right? The Peru team. So, uh, well, this is, is in the official Peruvian Federation of Box, you know? But still, as you can see, they have to work, not only train. They also have to go to the street to sell this uh, pens or anything else that they can sell to get funds for the federation. So after our walking tour and a great lunch, we're going back to the hotel where the rest of the uh, day is ours to do as we please. And this picture, I just thought it was interesting. The next morning, uh, we're off to the airport to catch a flight from Lima to Cusco. It's about an hour and a half flight up over the mountains. From the plane, we get right on a bus for a two hour ride up over the mountain down into the Sacred Valley. For the next portion of the trip, we're going to be at some substantial elevations. Cusco is at 11,152 feet, and the bus ride over, we go up over 12,500 feet. But the good news is, by the time we get to our hotel at Ur Obamba, we're back down to 9,420 feet. So all of us lowlanders will have a a chance to acclimate to the elevation a little bit better at this height. Manuel, our tour guide, is from Cusco and once we're on the bus he has a box lunch ready for us including homemade tamales prepared by his wife. Probably the best tamales I've ever had. And we're also joined by uh, his eldest son who uh, rode with us on the bus part way. The bus made several stops for us to get out, stretch our legs, and uh, take in some of the magnificent scenery. Here are some of the shots that I got on our way to the hotel. <music> This is what's known as a moto taxi, and uh, we saw quite a few of them during our visit to uh, Peru. And the first time that Gloria laid her eyes on one of these, she said, I want to ride in one of those. On day five of our Peru visit, when we came out of the hotel, we were expecting bus transportation to our first location. But lo and behold, Manuel had arranged for moto taxis for us as our mode of transportation for our first visit. So we all climbed in our respective taxis and it's off we go.
Our actual destination for the motor taxi ride was the private home where the lady of the house had a cottage industry of making chocolate products. So after some brief introductions, uh, she began going through the entire process of uh, gathering the uh, cocoa and making uh, the chocolate. So here are some of the images I captured uh, during our uh, morning of uh, learning about the process of making chocolate. And as you can see in the images, uh, we did have a chance to participate and kind of help out with the process. So it was a very educational morning and it gave us a, a really nice glimpse into the, the day in the life of uh, some of the people in the uh, Andes highlands of Peru. Things what the locals do. Okay, next. It's called a control freak. <laughs> You can start to smell a little bit. You can. Yeah. You ready? Sure. All right. We don't want We don't want to burn chocolate. So at the end of the demonstration, there were products that we could purchase, and uh, we got to sample some hot chocolate made from her chocolate. So then, as we were leaving, Manuel managed to squeeze in one more surprise for us. This is a hen, you know? And right here it is the male. Here, here is legal to do bullfighting and uh, cockfighting, you know? And uh, they are in several places. You know, they have here. So after that, we're, uh, we're walking down the road to the to the main road where we're going to hop on our bus, and we're off to our next adventure. For our next stop, we pulled up in the bus to uh, a building that looked like another cottage industry. Next to the welcoming sign was a red plastic bag on a stick. And I had recalled seeing them all over the Sacred Valley as we, we were riding around. And Manuel explained to us that it was a, a simple way of letting the public know the bar is open. So, we we're actually at a, chi -chi, <laughs> a chicharia. A chicharia is where they brew and serve chicha de ora, or corn beer. So once inside, we're all seated around a table and we're ready to begin our lesson on brewing chicha. Our instructor gave her talk in Spanish, but Manuel was there to translate for us. The beer, this corn beer, can be traced back to the time of the Incas and uh, they used it for ceremonial purposes back then, we were told. And our host even calls its establishment the Bar of the Incas. The beer is mostly made from corn products, but there are local variations throughout uh, South America that will add other ingredients. The soaked corn is then, um, I'm not quite sure how they were doing it, but it was either a malted system uh, and to get the, the thing started, or there's another way which we're not going to get into in this video. But then the, the point that I really want to make is after this, the dried corn is then ground by hand. No uh, food processor in this process. And then the, um, these ingredients are uh, taken to the stove and boiled for a while. So after the boiling, the product is poured through a mesh cloth into uh, vessels where I guess they let it ferment. I think most, if not all of us, sampled the beers and uh, it, it's not, not anything that I would want to drink again. This western palate didn't find it particularly uh, interesting. The version with the strawberries in it got a little bit more of a favorable nod, but still it's, uh, eh, not a, no, it's a no go. Here in the Sacred Valley and up in the highlands of the Andes, 
uh, the chicherias will sometimes offer a lunch. And there's a special lunch that you can get on a special request. With that featured dish being kui. And by the looks of things, I think the bar of the Incas had that on the menu. We just sampled the beer. No kui for us this time. Like most bars or pubs throughout the world, the uh, chicheras of uh, the Andes, the patrons will play games. And in the Andes of Peru, one of the more popular games is sapo. Sapo is Spanish for toad. And you would be correct in assuming that there's going to be a toad somehow involved with this game. The game is in the shape of a table. And on the top of the table are a series of holes uh, including the frog's mouth or the toad's mouth and coins tossed onto the table will fall through the hole down into the drawer underneath that has dividers in it and each divider has uh, a different score. You know if you build your own you can put any any number but this one has the highest you know including this one right here or this one too poor you know yes arrive and bring bring all day you know so, but the, you have to step back this way more. Send it like flat, not flipping like this, always. Oh, close. Mm. Oh, almost. Oh, oh, almost. Oh, almost. Oh, close. Very easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, three, yep. 490. You have to try it. Yeah. Let's try it. Since what, we are. So what's the better than a chicharia? Let's do it. Five, five. Uh, depending on how many. Uh, depending on how many in the team, you can make uh, two or three rounds. Forty. Forty. Five hundred. Ninety. We know who's gonna pay now. <laughs> oh, it wouldn't go in. No, oh, too. Uh, yeah. Oh, almost, almost. Sweet, sweet. All right, Karen, come now. All right. No, you, get a you aren't going to get any of them, are you? <laughs> come on, we didn't try it. Who didn't try it? Oh, ah, yeah, you're good. Just a touch. I mean, they have a. Oh, come on. Oh, it's almost into the frog's mouth. You got it. When everybody's done, I'll show you how it <laughs> So, after playing Sapo, we're off to the market. The markets here are uh, quite large, and um, all of the produce and the, the meats and all that, everything is divided up into sections. So, the produce and the, are in one section, the grains are in another, and the meat is in a, in a, a different section. So uh, you just go to that section to find whatever it is that, that you're looking for. A big part of the culture in this part of the world is the uh, the healing and and medical uses of herbs, and uh, you can buy a lot of those here in the market. And that would include the stimulant coca, coca leaves, which are legal in Peru up to a, a certain weight. <gasps> she is. This is also in the potato family. Yes. Some of you, I heard people calling this like pingolin potato. Yes, yes. Many people arrive here and they buy already done, you know. Yeah. They don't need to be doing this anymore. See, young generations. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you will give this to my grandma, she will call my wife. You know, they, there is a word for that. It's a wailaka. It's like to say, you are a soldier, you know. So it means you cannot do that. 
So after showing us around the market, Manuel turned us all loose to go purchase some produce for our lunch. That is after he coached us in the uh, a Spanish phrase to uh, use during our dealings. We found out later that it, it, the phrase was asking for a little extra. From the market, we arrive at a private home where uh, the table is set and uh, preparations are getting underway uh, for our lunch, which is going to be in this private home. What better way to uh, find out about the culture and, and the, the daily lives of the people here in the Sacred Valley than to actually go to a private home and uh, have them prepare a lunch for you? I might also point out that uh, here in Peru, uh, lunch is the main meal of the day. They, they typically don't have a great big meal um, at the dinner hour. It's usually in the afternoon. Mommy. We actually had uh, three generations in this household uh, working on our meal with us. Uh, just like at the uh, chicharia, we can see that uh, the stone is coming into play again to grind up the, the vegetables uh, as part of the meal preparation. Again, no food processor. And look who came out from behind the camera to help out a little bit. Thank you. Never believe it. Well, we're all seated around the table and uh, our meal is ready. Uh, all of the dishes were uh, original, uh, traditional Peruvian highland dishes, including the uh, cuy, which uh, didn't taste like chicken. The meal was very good, and it was really uh, great to meet uh, this family and interact with them and, and just have conversation with them over, over our lunch. Uh, it was a very worthwhile experience, I felt. After lunch, Manuel had arranged for someone to come in uh, to talk to us about a subject that uh, wasn't too pleasant. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, um, with this overseas adventure travel, uh, Peruvian and Ecuadorian trip, uh, the idea was not to glass things over and just show you the, the what's beautiful and, and what's really nice. We get to see everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You were going to experience the, the culture and the life here. This woman that, that came, uh, she came to talk to us about her experience with the forced sterilization. We learned that uh, between 1995 and 2001, it's been estimated by the health ministry in Peru that some 200,000 of the indigenous women of Peru suffered uh, this forced sterilization procedures. Uh, our guest gave witness to us about uh, her experience with this um, procedure that happened uh, following uh, or during one of her pregnancies. So after saying goodbye to our hostesses, um, we're back on the bus and we're uh, off to our next adventure. So after that fabulous lunch, our next stop is the uh, Seminario Pottery Factory. And besides being a pottery factory, where they're going to put an awful lot of ceramic products, it's also the workshop of Pablo Seminario, a renowned potterer in uh, this part of the world. In this picture, you can see the courtyard where we uh, waited for our tour guide to come and uh, fetch us. Okay, so over here you can see the Catao's machines are the wheels, okay, the pottery wheels. In the workshop, we have six wheels. In the other four wheels, 
are the laterally. <clears throat> so approximate 60% of the pieces are made in those machines. As I had mentioned in the beginning, uh, this gallery is also the workshop, the personal workshop of uh, Pablo Seminario. And uh, it's our good fortune that he happened to be in today and agreed to uh, have us come up into his his uh, private workspace and talk to us for a few minutes. How are you? Good, good. good. Well, welcome. Thank you. Well, I am Pablo Seminario. And this is the room where I do all these type of pieces. All this type of work. Here is the, where I do my artwork. That we began <coughs> four years ago researching on how the Peruvian native culture did their ceramic pieces. Hmm. I grew up looking at ancient pieces in Peru, north, northern coast. Mm -hmm. I grew up in that area, and I don't know why I have a curiosity since I was a child, how those very nice pieces were then. I saw all these nice pieces. Mm -hmm. Later, when I grew up, I went to Lima and I studied architecture. And I came to Cusco the year 79 for a work as an architect. But in 1979, 1980, there was a terrorist movement beginning here in Peru. Mm -hmm. So things got very bad. Mm -hmm. So, with my wife, we just decided to come to live to this area of Peru because it was supposed to be more easy to be through all those years. But time got worse, and I stopped doing architecture, and I began to do my dreams since I was a child on how to find the ancient techniques and to do a ceramic piece. Through the years, because this problem lasts into middle 90s, I researched, I found ancient techniques, I, I learned from some few traditional potters that they did very rustic pieces. And um, well, when things begin to go better in Peru in the middle 90s, uh, people begin to visit that small workshop that we had years ago. And they begin to buy our work. So we begin to grow, to grow, to grow, to grow. We move from one room to two rooms, to another house, to another house, until this space that we have now. It is very big, and now we're almost 50 people working here. We have created a style. We are using almost most of the ancient techniques of our work, and the influences from the ancient cultures, and this is what you're going to see here today. Mm -hmm. But my art is becoming more, more free, more contemporary. Mm -hmm. I have different styles that I've been working through the years. Uh, now I have a style that has to do a lot with the ancient cultures. Mm. I have a style that has to do with architecture, like that tile on the wall, that was my beginning, mm. where I had my first amount of clay, what I did, Cusco <coughs> colonial architecture, as an architect, what impressed me, what more, the Cusco, that, what you see is how I saw Cusco in those days. Mm. Ah. I don't know what I was, uh, I was smoking in those days, but I saw work in that way. So. <laughs> <laughs> I 
thought Pablo was very interesting, and I really appreciated him spending the time with us. Time for just a little bit of shopping in the gallery, and then we're going back to our hotel. On the way back to the hotel, Manuel laid out our plans for dinner. Turns out Manuel knows this guy. And this guy used to have restaurants, and he's now retired. But he still does a little bit of catering in his home, but only to groups like ours. Dinner was fabulous. During our free time, um, Gloria would spend a little time uh, doing some birding on the grounds of our hotel in Urbamba. While she did get a few life birds there, uh, the one that got uh, her the most excited was the giant hummingbird. They are the world's largest hummingbirds, and they are about nine inches long, about the size of a northern cardinal. This little giant liked to spend a lot of time in this tree canopy, so it made for challenging shooting conditions because it was so dark and, and backlit. Yeah. Today we are traveling to Machu Picchu, but we have a few stops to make on the way. Our first stop is a, an open area um, just on the outside of town. And here Manuel introduces us to a carandero. In this uh, ceremony that he's about to perform and will be participating in, it is a, uh, a, an ancient healing ceremony and uh, a prayer for good health and well-being and also to uh, thank Mother Earth for allowing us to visit the sacred valley. Ask a permit to the Apus. Apus are all these mountains that for us are sacred as they were in the past during Inca times and to Mother Earth, he says. And he's going to begin this despacho. He, by that, he has these blankets that he, hold, he calls a table. If you see, it's two blankets, one big one, another small one, and this paper showing that way you know that there is a big respect to Mother Earth. Now some um, things like peanuts. Taquillo. This place pasas. Raisins. Mm -hmm. But before you see he had cotton mm -hmm. which it represents the cows. Mm -hmm. Is there some this... significance with the rocks? No it's just to hold oh, yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> Después sigue cebo de alpaca o de llama, pero para los ops y la pachamama representa de queso. He's adding a part of llama and alpaca. He says that will represent like to the apples, like the cheese. Después lana colores. Mm. Pero representa de arco iris, siempre para en los cantos. That represents the rainbow. That is like protecting, you know, when you see a, a rainbow, you know, it seems like it's that's a dry meat of lamb. Mm -hmm. Baby lamb. 
I both enjoyed this. We, we felt like it was a real uh, interesting uh, look into the uh, Inca traditions, and it was a very moving ceremony. So we're back on the bus, headed from Urubamba to Olante Tambo.
Next up, we board a train to continue our journey to Machu Picchu. The ride on the train is a little under two hours, all along a, a river gorge all the way to Aqua Calentes, or Machu Picchu town. We all disembark from the train and we immediately walk over to the uh, bus station where we get one of the shuttles that snakes its way up the mountain so that we can see the Machu Picchu ruins. And now for the images that I captured during our first visit to Machu Picchu. The next morning is foggy and rainy, and we're at the uh, shuttle pickup spot early, but so were a lot of other people. So it was a long wait for us to catch the shuttle to take us up to the ruins. The previous day, this is what it looked like when we first got to see the ruins from uh, the first vantage point. This was the view this morning. But we weren't totally socked in. There, there were times when the fog would clear for just a little bit and uh, we could see off into the distance every once in a while. We had a couple of different options for what we could do today and uh, the majority of us chose to hike up to the Sun Gate. So we would be hiking on the, on the actual Inca Trail from Machu Picchu up to Sun Gate. So, some images from that hike.
little tour around the town of Machu Picchu Town. Most businesses in Peru leave their entryway doors wide open, and the free-roaming dogs in the city, like this little sad sack, just walk right in. This morning we're headed back to the train station to uh, reverse our route, and we're headed to Cusco. But we have a few stops on the way to Cusco. Just a short bus ride from the train station is our first stop. It's the massive Inca fortress in the uh, village of Olan Te Tambo. This is one of the few places where the Spanish lost a battle during their conquest of Peru in 1536. We are uh, able to climb up the uh, huge terraces that guard the uh, ancient hilltop temple. And so several of us did that. And now some of the images that I captured on our hike up to the top and the, the rest of the time that we spent in the area around the fortress. So, after visiting uh, the ruins at the uh, fortress of Olante Tambo, our next stop is lunch. And Manuel has found us another gem for our last meal in the Sacred Valley. The food was fantastic, and we even had live music. After lunch, we filter out to the parking lot to board the bus, and there's another surprise for us in the parking lot. Once we're on the bus and we're headed for uh, Cusco, I notice this truck in front of us with people on the top. They're on the roof. And from my vantage point, it looks like they're dangerously close to the wires that are hanging over the road. But for them, it was just another day in the life. Our next stop is at the village of Chinchero, and here we're going to see a weaving demonstration. She's going to explain to you about the process of, uh, of the weaving and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lydia. Welcome to this textile center. The name is Winya Awa. Those are Quechua words that means weaving forever. Here we are working different families from different rural communities. Um, for example, now they are going to introduce themselves in Quechua language. Okay, we need a picture of this. Now I have to have a picture of this. Hey, Gregorio. I have to have a picture of 
this for sure. So after the weaving demonstration, um, there was some time to do a little shopping uh, to pick up some treasures from this area, all handmade. Here we see Gloria looking at a, a couple of different items and uh, she picked out one she liked and it was time to haggle over the price. The bargaining was interesting because of the language barrier, so they ended up writing on her hand in ink. So after this interesting little stop, we're back on the bus and here Gloria is trying on her new poncho. So after a little bit of a bus ride, we arrive in Cusco. It was a pretty nice hotel and uh, they had a really nice restaurant right on site and uh, our room had a little balcony on it. So uh, here's a couple of scenes from out on the balcony. And actually, um, in the uh, late afternoons, we had a little entertainment right on the street outside our balcony. As our time in Peru comes to a close, I just want to thank Manuel for showing us all of the interesting sites that he, he shared with us and for sharing so much of the culture of the Peruvian people. We truly enjoyed our time in Peru.